This message kicks the series off, and I am calling it Gas Lamps and Electric Lights. Gas Lamps and Electric Lights. You might think, why? Well, you'll see in just a moment. Let me tell you a story I love by starting with a story. Sorry, I'm having to read this from down here, so I'm not going to be able to look at you properly for a minute or so. But here's a story for you. It was the year of 1812, and the year of 1812 saw the birth of the gas lighting industry. Around this time, the police force in the city of Manchester saw new and innovative ways to be able to light the streets of the city so that they could promote safety. As the years went by, gas lamps were installed on many, many streets, not just in Manchester, but also all around the country. The problem was, however, that they had to be locally controlled and managed. Many had to be kind of just filled single-handedly. If only there was a way of just being able to link all of them up together in one go so you didn't have to do that local management. Enter a man named Lord Weir. Now, Lord Weir was a really clever guy, and in 1925, he made a brilliant suggestion. He said, let's create something that we will call the Central Electricity Board. And Lord Weir's idea is that the Central Electricity Board would link up the UK's most efficient power stations with their consumers via a huge nationwide system called the National Gridiron. It was set up the following year in 1926, to, and it was done so to standardise the nation's electricity supply. And by 1935, bearing in mind just nine years later, the UK national grid had been born, and it was the first of its kind in the whole world. As the years have rolled by, lifestyles have changed and demand for electricity has increased. This has resulted in big changes on an ongoing basis within the national grid to cope with evolving needs. The year of 2019 saw the UK reach an historic electricity generation milestone with more electricity generated from zero carbon sources than fossil fuels. Isn't that, good? Isn't that great for the planet? The fact that the UK has, for almost 100 years, had such a strong, efficient and integrated power system is something to behold. Something to be used with ease and something to be proud of. Now, why on earth am I talking to you this morning about the national grid? Well, quite simply, can I ask you this morning, as we begin this series called Empowered, what would you rather be? Would you rather be a single gas lamp powered by whatever you have in your own tank, or would you rather be a bright electric light plugged into the national grid that goes all the way through the country? Any plug socket anywhere on the national grid. Where would you rather be? The point of this series, Empowered, which is going to take place for the next three weeks after today, is that we're going to go back through the things that we've talked about as our annual focus points. Prayer, evangelism, discipleship. But we're cranking it up a notch. We're going to look to see the difference that is made to these three things when we don't just prioritise them, but we bring God right into the equation. When we invite the Holy Spirit, not just into those practices, but into our lives and allow him to change us. You see, going back to the gas lamps and electric light story, a gas lamp is okay. It's fine. It can burn pretty brightly. It can bring an illumination to any place that you put it in. It can make a real difference. But the difference with that is it is totally reliant on the fuel that is put into this, that single gas lamp alone. It needs to be constantly refueled. It's alone, and it's only as powerful as long as it has fuel of its own making, fuel in its own tank. But the difference is, when you're a bright electric light, when you're a bright electric light, you can, just by plugging in and click, 
flicking the switch, be instantly empowered. You don't need to worry about the source, the fuel. It comes to you. Plug it into the main socket, flick the switch, and hey, presto, you've got light, you've got power, whatever. Not only that, but you are immediately connected in through that plugging in and that flicking onto a powerful system that stretches right up from John O'Groats right down to Land's End. That's far. I don't know if you've been to either, but I've, been to, I've not been to John O'Groats, but I've been to Land's End, and it's far from Lincoln, let alone from John O'Groats. That's a big system to plug yourself into. You see, it, the system is far bigger than just you alone. It connects you not only to a power source, but in an incredible way to every other mains user, every other, you could say, bright light in the country. See, the power is always on, always available. And the system amazingly can cope with whatever demands we place on it. If you can't see where I'm going with this, a gas lamp is a Christian who, yeah, does a great job, lives maybe quite a powerful life. But in a sense, despite living a great life, despite illuminating the room around them, they're doing so under their own strength. You see, they're not partnering with God. They're glorifying God, but without his true power flowing inside of them. They never quite know his power, his presence, like they could. A gas lamp is great, but I don't think it's enough. And it's not enough for the lives that we need to live today. However, a bright light, a bright lamp Christian, is a person who doesn't rely on what they have inside of them. Oh no, there's someone who will plug themselves into the national, the heavenly grid of God's presence all the time. And they will seek his power his presence, his power source, not just their own, not just their own. What also happens is that when you're plugged into God's power source, you begin to see things from his point of view far more than you ever could have before. You begin to be able to tolerate those annoying Christians around you, those people who aren't very nice, those people who you do your head in, you begin to see them in a new way. It's a new channel for grace and mercy to flow. Today, I believe God says you don't need to be a gas lamp and rely on your own power. Plug yourself into the mains and rely on my power and it will come like flicking a switch. Today, I believe God says you don't need to do it alone. You no longer need to operate under your own strength, and you know whether or not you are. What's more, he says, I want you to be filled with my presence. I want to come and inhabit your life so that you don't have to do this alone. And God has said this in Scripture many times, and one of the times he said this was in Zechariah 4, verse 6, where he said, this is the word of the Lord Almighty. Not by might, not by might, not by human strength, not by power, not by human power, human conjuring, human strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, by God's power, by God's presence, by God's, from God's source. Why, why on earth? Would God have done this? Well, Jesus said this in John 14, 15, 16. I haven't really got time to go into this now, but there are all sorts of reasons as to why we should be accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. If we want to pursue a God-centered life, we want to, want to have uh, lives of real powerful prayer, if we really want to evangelize in a new way, if we really want to be discipled and disciple others, we need to do it with his power and his presence. We need to. And in John 14, 15, 16, Jesus said this. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. Just as a bit of a hint there, it's much easier to keep God's commands when you've got the Holy Spirit helping you than when you haven't. 
He said, I will ask the, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So he comes to help us and to be with us forever. He helps us in so many ways. He's sent to be our helper. If you imagine if you had to go to court tomorrow, you could either stand there and you could present a case in a legal world, and this is for everybody who's not a legal professional, but you could go and you could try and present a case, and that is going to be difficult. That might even be impossible. You may not be able to do it. You may, your mind just may not compute what you're doing. But if you have a barrister or a solicitor speaking on your behalf, then it's going to make it so much easier. It takes so much of the pressure off. They will do all of that. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's our advocate. He speaks on our behalf. In the, the Greek word that is used there, by, was used there in the, new, the original New Testament was the word paraclete, from the word parakletos. And it means someone to be with us, someone to care for us, someone to comfort us, and someone to speak to us. And also I believe, and I've seen this in my own life, Quite often when we allow God not only to speak to us, but when we commit our ways to us, he can also speak through us. I've been in time, situations before where I've been saying, Lord, I don't know what to do, to this per- do, do with this person or say or whatever. And I've just said, will you please help me? Give me the words to say. And bang, I'm saying things and not even realizing what words are coming out. Why is that? Because I believe I, I want to be a, pl- a person who is filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I want him to undertake and to help me. In these difficult times that we're living in, Lord, we pray as the spring comes, that so will we be able to get out and be with one another again soon. But in these difficult times, the Holy Spirit can comfort you, can bring you comfort like no one and nothing else. We've been encouraging over the last three weeks of 2020, uh, within 2021, to prioritize these three areas of prayer, evangelism, discipleship. Prayer, evangelism, discipleship. You see, these are all good things on their own, but you don't have to try to approach them alone. When you do so in the power of the Holy Spirit, rather than having feeling like you need to do it under your own strength like that gas lamp, when you plug yourself into the power of God, then everything changes. Everything becomes so much easier. Your prayer times will become more powerful. You will see things you hadn't seen before. When you commit your prayers to God and you say, Lord, lead me today, he'll lead you in a completely different way to the way you could have ever led yourself. When you seek to evangelize, when you seek to share your faith, to, to, we could say, witness, as in be a witness for God to other people, the fear that you might have once had might not be gone completely, maybe a little bit of it's good, but it just won't be the issue it was once before. When you said, Jesus, you've made such a difference to my life and I just want other people to know He will help you. His power will be made perfect in any weakness you may have. And what's more, when you do step out, when you do so in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, then as you evangelize other people, as you tell other people your story about how good Jesus is, what the difference a life with God really is, you will be able to speak in a new way. Your words could become sharper than a double-edged sword that can open someone's heart right up and speak right into their issue, right into their life. That's what happens when you evangelize, when you pray under the power of the Holy Spirit. But what about your discipleship? Well, this covers so many bases. But quite simply, in seeking to become more like Jesus, when we do so under the power of the Holy Spirit, he will lead us into ways that we didn't even know existed. A little bit like Tim Keller put it on Twitter over the last couple of days. He said, when we go to God with real and sincere hearts and with big questions, what we will find over time is it's not so much that we were seeking an answer, but quite often we were asking the wrong question. That's real wisdom. That's what so often happens in our discipleship when we really seek to follow Jesus with all of our hearts. 
in case you're unsure, and I'm, I'm almost through, but in case you're unsure, if you're thinking, well, has this ever actually really happened or is this just textbook stuff? Look at the life of Peter. The Apostle Peter. You see, just before Jesus was about to go to the cross, just as Jesus has been arrested, and it's like, he's, gonna, he's, he's in trouble now, Jesus is in serious difficulty and Peter is given an opportunity to speak up on Jesus' behalf. What does he do? He denies him. He disowns him. He hates himself for it, but he doesn't have the strength to do it himself. So why did Peter deny Jesus? Well, I believe because he didn't really know who Jesus was yet and because he was trying to follow Jesus under his own strength. Yet less than two months later, less than two months, think about where you were two months ago. Alfie, if you're watching this, Nottingham Forest were nearly in the relegation zone. Now they're climbing the table. 11, one defeat in 11. Where were you two months ago? Well, Peter, two months after denying Jesus Christ, is in front of a crowd of people boldly preaching. The Holy Spirit has just come upon him and he's changed everything. He's boldly preaching the name of this man who he denied moments, less than two months before, and over 3,000 people are saved in one day. What's the difference? I believe there are two main reasons. Two main reasons why I, be I believe that this denying disciple suddenly became a pow bold, powerful, fearless, and successful apostle. An apostle is someone who is a delegate who is sent on God's behalf with a special mission. There are two reasons, I believe. One, he realized now who Jesus really was because he'd witnessed the resurrection. He knew he'd seen Jesus come from death to life. Secondly, he'd been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That changed everything for Peter. Go back to the Old Testament. Moses couldn't be really direct and really properly help the Israelites because their hearts were really hard. But apostles like Peter and then Paul could speak plainly and boldly with the truth and love of God and see success because their lives and the lives of the people who they got to know had been transformed because this happened after the Holy Spirit had come to come and be with his people forever until Jesus returns and makes that new heaven and that new earth that I spoke about last week. As a side note, this is why if a, and I, I truly mean this in your discipleship, if a friend ever comes to you in love and says, my friend, I don't think you should be doing this and here's why I'm challenging you on the basis of love here. That's why you should accept it. Because you can, tr as Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, you can trust what a wound from a friend more than you can a thousand kisses from the devil. Because a cha if a challenge comes with not just truth, but love as well. You might say, well, that's okay for Peter. It's okay for Paul. It might be okay for people I know. It might be okay for people in my church. They might have been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, but I don't think I need him. I'm not bothered, or I'll just do it myself. Well, Peter wasn't actually special. He was just a regular guy on a great mission for God. Paul was the same. Paul actually said that people like him are regarded as the scum of the earth. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think you're in the same category. I think you're just an ordinary man or woman or child like them. What do we have in common with Peter, with Paul, with so many other people? Well, Peter and Paul both lived through the time when Jesus was on the earth and when Jesus was resurrected. They also lived through the time when the Holy Spirit came in power. So do we. We live post-resurrection and in the time where the Holy Spirit is here on earth with his people. We live in this legacy and we can access and live within that same power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus 
from the dead, if we so wish. He won't force his way upon you, but he wants to be with you. As it says in Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So this morning, my friend, if you are feeling dry, like there's little life inside of you, it's quite possibly because you need to be either filled with the Holy Spirit or he just needs to be stirred up again inside of you. The Holy Spirit coming upon us is life-changing. But we have to make the choice whether we're going to be a gas lamp forever or whether we want to be plugged into his power source that makes all the difference. Do you want to go under your own strength in this life or in God's? So I return to where I started. Do you want to be a gas lamp doing it under your own strength? Or do you want to be a bright light plugged into the same web network as millions, maybe even billions of others, into God's national grid. It makes our walk easier. It makes other Christians seem lovable rather than as annoying as they might be at the moment. If all Christians around the world are winding you up at the moment, it's probably because you need to change in some way. God will take care of them. You need to know. Show their love, God's love, to them. The power of God, the presence of God, transforms your devotional life. It gives you the power and boldness for prayer and for evangelism. He will help you. In the next three weeks, we're going to demonstrate this to you. But I encourage, just as I finish by praying, I encourage you to think upon these words. And I, I want, as I finish, I want to encourage you just to perhaps put, wherever you are, put your hands out in front of you and to pray with me. Remember these words. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by power. Not by what you can do, not what you have in your tank but by his power, his strength. You don't have to do it alone anymore. That load that you've... This, um, I really think I'm speaking to a few people here. These loads that you've been carrying on your back, life is so difficult because you're trying to do it all your own. He says to you today, come to me, you who are weary and burdened. Give me your burdens and I'll give you some rest. Because do you know what? The life... When, when you live your life, I really believe this, when you live your life under the power and presence and direction of the Holy Spirit and you try and do these things like prayer evangelism and discipleship and more, when you try and do that under his strength, it, not only does it change everything, but it's just re genuinely, it's not so flipping hard. <laughs> Still, you have your tough days. It's nowhere near as difficult as it was without him. So I want to pray. And I pray that as this happens, that you will put your hands out, that you will put your heart into a position where you want to receive the Holy Spirit, either to be stirred up inside you and renewed, or to be filled for the first time. You know, when he comes, he so often marks his coming with, just like a guest, when a guest comes to your house and they bring a gift, well, he often brings you a gift like tongues, like a, a powerful ability to be able to see things prophetically like never before. A new vision, a new desire, a new power, a new ability to love God and to serve his people. So let's pray. Just get yourself into that receiving mode. And I pray, Father, simply come. We invite you, Lord, I invite you now to fall on your people afresh. Not just to fall from head to toe, but Lord, to well up within them. I pray right now, Lord Jesus, you will come and you will touch your people in a new way. Lord, those who have may, might have been walking with you for a long time and those not, Lord, I pray you will fill them right now. Give us, Lord, the power and the strength to be able to walk with you, to walk 
in a new way. Seriously, friends, just receive him. Be open. He will come. If, if the reason he hasn't come into your life before, if you've been tra- at this many, many times, there's a blockage somewhere and it's normally that there's something. Search your heart. Ask God to show you what it is. Deal with it and then move forward. Be filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I bless you with that. Keep praying, keep believing. Jesus is in control, God's on the throne, and he's coming back for his church. And he wants you to be empowered today. Amen.